was in Athens, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I never was. You were not in Athens. <laughs> I never was. <laughs> And that also opens up the space, because one of the things we wanted to do was look at that across a very widely conceived Europe without boundaries. Um, and to think about the movement of forms helps you move away from thinking about things being cut off one from the other by specific languages. Um, so that's one of the things. So we wanted to look at the way form moved back and forth across for me it's also about how we can use or develop new uh, conceptual frameworks for moving across different scales, so yeah. reconciling uh, these broad uh, panoramic views and mm. actual objects, so being able to reconcile this, these two dimensions in, in a coherent methodological framework. And I think with that, if it's a way that you can come up with a framework that maybe not necessarily that transcends time as well, mm -hmm. um, and also can transcend the the the, the medium potentially um, as well, so you, you can be in that sense. You know, truly interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. I think um, when you look at form in all these different ways that we, we tend to separate. So that's that for me. Yeah. I think it's a good thing to do the ways in which. I mean, I'm more concerned with literary forms, but the ways in which they changed, they change in between languages. So that in the process of translation from one language to another, or in the process of translation, translocation from one place to another. What happens to a literary form? I mean, what happens to us with something like an epic when it moves between Latin and French and English? Mm. And there's a way in which, you know, medieval literacy is always comparative, partly because there's always the sort of the great contact zone with Latin that floats above everything, and everybody learns to read and write in Latin, which is nobody's mother tongue. And then on the other hand, there's a sort of horizontal contact zone where people are endlessly coming into contact with each other via different vernaculars. Um, and I think there's two dimensions of how much has to change in the process of translating between languages or between translating, moving between places and the sort of profound translations that come out in that process. Yeah, this allows us to account for what what changes and what remains, and also uh, um, to think about continuities and discontinuities. That's, that's crucial. Because what we really don't want to do is homogenize. Mm -hmm. We want to we wanted to think of ways to think about 
literary and digital culture in ways that let us see what is connected, but also, as you say, what's disconnected. Mm. And there's another element, of course, and that is the transformative force. Yes. Mm. Because actually, it's, uh, it's uh, the, you could call the susceptible. Perception, but actually, it's uh, the word or the image as a force on the one yeah. who's looking or reading. Actually, the transformation is, of course, as soon as you want to transform, you have to transform. The, your, your, your thoughts have to transform into words, which have to transform to the other one to actually pure physically have this transformation. But at the same time, actually, it's doing something much more deep. It is the same as when, what are you meeting when you meet a page or when you meet a an image or something like that? What, the, what, is, what is it that you meet actually? There's also this transformation, mm -hmm. this sort of transformational effect. So they are simultaneously transformative of that place, if only by providing a new perspective on it, and a new shaping it anew, but also that they must in turn respond to the environment and make themselves work in that environment. And also that you have a difference, of course, you have a very, well, as you said, you have a transformation and translocation of epic from, let's say, from Spain, from Spanish, from Spain to, uh, to the Latin culture, or even around, or to French. But of course, it's a Spanish epic. In the middle, middle ages, the same and at the, at the same way received as is a Latin epic, yeah. probably not, because it is a completely, completely different in the surroundings, and also the people expect something else from it, and also the writer, the one who composes it, whatever way, they expects to achieve something different the Latin than the Spanish. So this transformation, I, I return to this transformative force, but I think that's one of those elements that that also that determines translocation of things. It can't be translocated if it doesn't have a, a transformative force. No, and I think you know, with something like epic, I think people would, at certain points, I would have said, well, if it isn't in Latin, it isn't an epic. Yeah. Or they would have just treated all of these as epics in some kind of trans-historical way. And I think that this is some way of trying to do, mm. trying to allow for mm. and attend to both the fact that people are thinking about something like epic, they do have it in mind as they're moving to thoughts and thinking about how you would recreate that in another time, another place, another language, another context. But at the same time, so it, it does allow you to attend to both the sort of the large sense of ideas that are tra being transmitted, but also the way in which you, you also get the differences, the local, the particular, um, yeah. the general. And as, as you said before, the scale, and trying to think really hard about how we move from scale up and scale down. Yeah. Yeah. And also about what the Levine called the affordance of uh, forms, yeah, so yes. which forms are more flexible, yeah. more yeah. adaptable. Yeah. Yeah. Affordance in the sense of what they allow you to do, to do yeah. with uh, what, what they permit mm. to both the, well, as opposed to a whole range of people, really, I mean, to the producer and the consumer, mm. or the producers in a number of ways, I mean, a writer or an artist, but also, for instance, a book producer. Um, there's a whole set of things that, that different forms afford, commit at different times and different places. Mm. And they can afford, as you say, the same text, the same form, can, af can afford radically different things. Yes in different times and contexts, contexts, even whilst being connected. Mm -hmm. That's it. I think that... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I suppose when I started thinking about moving forms and transformations and translocations, I was um, uh, thinking about how we might make it concrete, as it were, in some kind of way. So thinking about networks, thinking about pathways, um, and thinking about um, maybe the universality of those kinds of pathways and networks. So obviously things, things that you know apply to kind of 
particular cultural situations, but also kind of overarching networks and overarching kind of you know, patterns and forms that bring the whole kind of issue of transformation transportation together. So when, when I saw the, uh, the announcement for a conference of moving forms, um, I guess I was mostly attracted by the fact that it's such a, such a wide-ranging idea. You can, you can really talk about, about so many things, that, isn't, that are so many forms that are moving, so many things that are transformed and transformed. Um, and from my perspective, as an, as an Arabist working on uh, Arabic literary works of the, of the, let's say, the late Middle Ages, mm -hmm. um, there were quite a lot of things I could think of that would fit. I could think of poetry, which is highly mobile in the, in the Arabic world. I ended up settling for, um, for letters, which are mobile by definition, but they're also mobile in the sense that they combine different uh, literary strands within them, and then they move from text to text as well. Um, but I guess for me, the so that was how I approached it. But what, what really surprised me about the conference is how all these mobile forms started interlocking, mm -hmm. and how all these different backgrounds, all these different traditions, suddenly started speaking to each other and really enlightening each other. And that was for me, uh, it's been the great benefit of this, uh, this symposium to me, that I can, I've learned from people working on Irish, um, as in, or people working on uh, completely different strands of the, of the, of the European uh, or Eurasian landmass. So that's been, been wonderful for me. I've been to meetings of the center before and I very much appreciate the breadth of interests, the many people who I would never meet at other conferences, the openness, the exchange. So I'm all I almost feel a little bit an outsider to this in that my work is so very much focused on Western Europe. I do not have the languages for anything else, if nothing, if nothing else. And so I try to approach it in a way that would do justice to the interest of this particular uh, question, the moving of forms, and also transculturally. So the best I could think of was Western interest in the East. I can't speak to the East as such. I do not have the languages. <laughs> uh, at the same time, it was enticing to me because that question had come up so often. When I read 11th century literature, especially 11th century literature that is in any way connected to schools and schooling, it is often striking to me how important these images are, both the desert idea, the idea of being completely isolated in, in, in a vast solitude, that's one of the ideas, but also the idea of going out from where you are, possibly a bit beyond where you should. <laughs> Moving out of school, that's what the Ekbasis Kaptiri is all about. Mm -hmm. Moving out of your comfort zone, uh, going to where it gets dangerous. And that is one of the things that the Eastern desert spirituality does for Western European monks and nuns, especially the young ones, I think. And so that, that was one of my points of connection. The other really was, as I said in my talk, when I heard moving forms and I was reading about Mary of Egypt, who in one way is entirely static most of the time, and that's how Gosling describes her in his work, she sits still under the sun. She is unsheltered. She has nothing to protect her. She has no contacts. She just is. At the same time, the first time we see her, she is running from us <laughs> and not accessible and doesn't want to stop for us and we have to do something to make her stop and talk to us. So I thought that paradox of something that is at one time, at, at the same time, sort of very much its own thing, self-contained, unapproachable, and at the same time so much in motion that it's almost hard to get a hold of. But we, met, but very much desired by us. Mm -hmm. Those are those are the ideas that I put together for it. But I'm also, and maybe primarily, 
listening and profiting from the people here who speak about things that are not within my schooling, that are not within my expertise, and that are so necessary to us Western medievalists to get at least some information about. Yeah, when I think of translocation, transformation, I, I partly think of it as, as something that we have been doing in, in, in the sense of planning and, and so on, so I've heard about it. But I've also, I, 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 it takes me to a part of my work which deals very much with uh, text that travel a long distance. Um, so, uh, well, translocation is, is very obvious for a text coming from India and, and ending up in, in, in Europe. Um, and and, and uh, transformation is as pertinent because uh, well it, it, it changes language. It may also change other things uh, of this sort of general kind, like religious affiliation and such. I'm speaking especially about the Bhagavad Gita story, but other texts also travel this distance. And um, and then there's a lot of uh, other types of changes that you can point to. But but uh, what is on the other hand also of interest to me is what actually remains the same how, how, how well given the size of, of, of this uh, this travel um, you could almost claim some kind of universality to, 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 to the interest um, of course it's, it is bound to time and play in certain types of, 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 of um, Society and so on, but still, I think uh, that that interests me. So, also forms that that do not change in a sense, uh, or things that that remain the same. Um, but but um, and, and and in terms of network, which I think is so uh, central, crucial to to the, to the whole idea about why we we study old texts, because if not, if they remain just s s small, you know. Uh, flimsy things to us uh, and, 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 and well we, in a sense we, we just then produce our own ideas about it behind but the, the study of it reveals so much new so much different uh, uh, from our own um, things that are very similar to our own um, um, experiences of, of, of networks but but um, but in terms of this long traveling text you have the, this feeling that each, for example, each translator, of course, also audiences and so on. But translators are working in, in can be working in quite secluded uh, places, and, and and will not necessarily have anything to do with the next step of translation. Uh, so in that sense, there's a there's a sort of a sequence of networks rather than one big network, um, and and, um, and sometimes not. I mean, sometimes it is actually. There is a link back. Um, it fascinates me that the Georgian translator of the bottom story into to Greek had a grandfather whose name is clearly Arabic, and um, well, the Georgian uh, version came from an Arabic version. So perhaps that was a link across, uh, and those kind of networks. Um, well, they, they 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 tell us a lot. They they transform our impression of of, of, of stories of texts of. Of the past. Well, I have been thinking a lot, not just lately, but over the past few years, about the way in which stories in particular move between languages and between cultures. So that's sort of what came to my mind immediately was that I wanted to talk about storytelling um, from this perspective. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to open up for, um, for thinking about the combination of the technicalities of transferring stories and the more vague transfer of stories orally and between people who simply meet. So I, I tried to combine form as a more 
technical rhetorical device with um, forms of telling stories um, from a more narratological or literary perspective. And I also wanted to combine East and West somehow. I mean, I don't work on Western literature, but I do work sometimes on translations or adaptations of Western stories in the East and the other way around, either myself or through students or colleagues. Uh, and I think there is just so much more work to be done in that field. So this kind of event is really in a fantastic opportunity to learn more about all the things we don't know and, and just get together and, and try uh, try thinking together and accepting how how little we know. So um, it's um, it's really great to be here and do that. <laughs> looking at various legends, how they traveled from the uh, east to the west and how they were transformed in this process. So I was so glad to see these colorful papers. I thought that's, that's something for me and uh, I was, I'm glad I could make it here because then I, I got so many ideas now so I can go on and keep working on this project on rewriting by something like <laughs> Well, um, since being so many years a part of CML, um, uh, it was not really uh, a new concept for me, so um, it, I saw it coming, so it's, it's one of the, <laughs> of the uh, big topics for CML, but I was actually very happy to see the concept of forum, right, it's something new and, um, you know, forum is such a capacious uh, tool. And um, uh, as I said uh, in one of the discussions, I can always, be, uh, I can always talk about form. And I think that the framework, the conceptual framework, gave us um, a lot of opportunities to raise very important questions in our respective disciplines, whatever these disciplines are, um, disciplines that work on the uh, borderlines of uh, ge different geographies, different disciplines, uh, core uh, defined concepts, uh, unclear textual traditions, so it's, you know, the list is so long. Uh, and um, it was also interesting for me not only to uh, uh, enhance my understanding of uh, problems that uh, Trouble me, but also to see other people uh, thinking about their uh, disciplines within the framework um, and probably coming outside of this room with very different ideas than when they entered it three, three days ago. Thank you.